Hello, Internet. We are live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 42 of the Stanford MLSIS seminar series. I'm Kern, and as always, we have with us Dan, Piero, Fyodor, and our guest today, Baishaki Ray from uh, Columbia University. Very beginning, or is it? Yeah. Are we online? Okay. Hello. Okay. Um, let me just make sure that everything is good on YouTube. Just, and I think we're streaming live right now, but. Yeah, we are back. Okay, great. Um, so, hey everyone, sorry for the technical difficulties, but um, we can start from the top again. So welcome to episode 42 of the Stanford MLS Seminar Series. Um, I'm Kron, we have with us Piero, Dan, Piero Matei, and our guest today by Shaki Ray from Columbia. Um, as always, we're gonna do a 30 minute talk followed by a 30 minute podcast style discussion where you in the YouTube live chat can ask questions uh, and post comments. Um, a little bit about our speaker today. Um, Bashaki is an associate professor at Columbia University where uh, she works on um, software engineering and machine learning. Um, she's received a bunch of awards uh, for her work, including the NSF Career Award, IBM Faculty Award, and the Early Career Award, and as well as gotten many best paper awards. Um, and today she's gonna be talking to us about improving software reliability using machine learning. Um, a little bit before I cue Bishagi in, a little bit of a happy note, uh, which I think I said before as well, before we went off stream, but this is our one year anniversary. So um, thanks so much for tuning in and hopefully we'll keep going for a few more years. Um, Bishagi, take it away. Thanks, Karan. Uh, so yeah, here I am. Thanks for inviting me. And today I will talk about how we can improve software reliability using machine learning. So in today's world, we use software all the time, right? In almost every aspect of our life. And with the enormous growth of software and its utility, the software artifacts also are growing a lot. And this is not only in terms of the source code that developers are writing, but there are a lot of other software related artifacts that are growing. So for example, we can log all the bugs that developers are facing, how they fix the code, whatever they are talking about. I mean, uh, the textual description that uh, developers write to in their day-to-day -day life related to their software engineering task. Um, of course, user reviews, then the QA forums, uh, et cetera. And as uh, most of you are aware of, there are a lot of even open source platform that help us to archive this uh, software engineering data. So for example, in GitHub, Bitbucket, we can archive all our source code that we are writing in our day-to-day -day life, along with test cases, bugs, issues, et repository that can archive all the bug related stuff stack overflow our q a um, kind of forum that address developers are facing and also platforms like aws etc where you can run your software and collect traces to analyze systems uh, behavior or or other the environment how software interact with environment etc so once we record all these uh, your project or software related activities. Now our job or where machine learning can be very, uh, a very much applicable because of this huge volume of software engineering related data that are getting generated. We can learn the hidden patterns uh, from these data and that will help us to leverage 
that is that will help us to build smart software engineering tools so for example um, as a as an artifact we produce we generate a lot of source code byte code execution traces there are a lot of text associated uh, to these uh, artifacts like bug reports code comments description as well as other metadata like uh, software specification, pre post condition, high level properties, how we will configure your program, etc. And uh, there are also evolutionary data, right? Given uh, software is changing, uh, how developers change code uh, is also a, a very active area of research. So traditionally, all the artifacts where you don't need to run the software. We call it static analysis. And as the name applies, whenever we need to run the software, uh, like execute the software, and we do some analysis on top of that execution or using execution, that falls under dynamic uh, analysis. And it turns out AI-based analysis, uh, it can be deep learning models, it can be reinforcement learning or many other variant. But in all these artifacts, um, AI-based model can be extremely uh, powerful. And we are uh, in my lab, we are investigating on that. But I would say that this is a very active area of research in uh, SEPL security as well as uh, machine learning community and many, many of my other colleagues are actively working on this domain. So with that, today, as the job, uh, this uh, title goes, my talk title goes, I will focus on how we can use this machine learning based model to improve software quality. So in general, how we can detect bug as well as fix the bugs. And today I will concentrate my talk mostly on static analysis in particular source code. So we are not assuming that we will run the code or anything uh, in, largely. If I have a source code, how AI model can help me to improve the quality. So let's take a step back and see why even applying machine learning is possible in this scenario. So it turns out software is very repetitive. The way developers write code in their day-to-day -day life is very repetitive. And not only that, the way they introduce bugs and fixes the bug are also very repetitive. For example, this is a bunch of code we uh, mined from uh, GitHub open source Java, uh, Java projects. And as you can see, this this uh, line marked in red, like return super dot equals object, that appeared many times in several places in the code. And it turns out for some reason there was a bug there. And what developers did in all the places, they fixes the code by just changing this kind of call, like super dot equals call to uh, this equal to equal to object. So these kind of repetitive patterns are all over the places. And now our question is whether it is possible to leverage such repetitive part patterns to detect and fix bugs. So, well, uh, probably obvious thing um, when I show you that is that, well, can we use some template-based solution? Simply search pattern, right? So I know this is my template, like the super call should be replaced by this equal to equal to object. So first you can take the buggy code marked in red, search in the rest of your code base whether that kind of template is there. You found one, then you can simply replace that with the fixed pattern with this the green code. So in fact, previously, uh, researchers used to do that a lot. There are a lot of work uh, to do bug detection and fixes with such template-based solution. But one of the problem with such template-based practice 
practice is that if there is a slighted variation, right? Like as here you can see, the there is a code in your code base. Instead of equals, there we use n equals, and you are expected to fix that with not equal to sign. So this is a slight variation of the pattern uh, or template you developed. And even with such slighted variation, the template based solution will not work. So probably you can imagine by now the success of such template based solution depends a lot on manual templates and which is absolutely not scalable. You have to write a lot and lot of templates to do that. And also it requires a lot of domain expertise. So the question is that, then how AI can help in such scenario? Uh, we will see that, but even, even before that, let's see that if we can just train a standard model developed for so natural language processing domain or vision domain, can we uh, improve this kind of, can we, can we generalize these patterns that we are seeing and uh, apply it for the like unseen slightest uh, variation of the patterns? So my short answer is yes. And many researchers, including some of our early papers have shown that there is an immense potential to apply this kind of off the shelf model to software corpora and improve many software engineering related tasks. But now I argue that, well, there is a very good potential, but it's still, I mean, the success is to some extent it's limited. And the reason is that by nature, source code is very different from natural language. So think about a simple while loop that I have written here. This while loop has a lot of structure. And this is the syntax tree structure representation of that while loop. And it shows not only the tree structure, but the type of each node, how they are related. So basically, an uh, even small piece of source code contains a rich syntactic structure. And not only that, they are the variables and identifiers, they have interdependency. So for example, the Y uh, uh, used in foo, calling foo as a parameter has a data dependency relation to its previous line, right? So they are not independent. So when we will think about code analysis using machine learning, we have to think about such syntactic correctness as well as contextual correctness. So here, uh, some further example, if you look at this if uh, block here, this if is a valid token, right? Uh, keyword in your language. However, in this particular example, that if is used as an object, which is wrong. And if you try to compile this piece of code, which is apparently, which looks good, uh, will not compile, it will give syntactic error. Similarly, look at this code. Everything is apparently looking good. It looks like real code, but look at this F here, which is passed as a method parameter. However, this is an, uh, this is basically a function, right? So it is a very unusual code, to, I mean, unusual way to write it in this context. Similarly, see the return null uh, statement. This function f should expect to return a Boolean. However, here the generated, the AI generated code, or, or even it can be developed, there it is a bug, right? Because you should not uh, return null for a, function return, which is expecting Boolean. So while thinking about building machine learning models for source code, we have to think about this kind of syntactic as well as contextual correctness. Not only that, code has a lot of functional properties. And that's why code is much, much less ambiguous than a natural language text. So for example, our favorite example, that while uh, loop, small while loop, if I change uh, uh, slightly 
and add in, instead of less than, I add less than equal to, the semantic of this small while loop changes a little bit. So it the code no longer has the same functionality. However, look at the green block where the structure or the loop of this while loop is very different from the gray while loop, but their functionality is very similar. So all these examples are trying to show us that while we will develop model for source code, we have to, of course, think about how they are represented, like how their tokens look like. However, we have to also think about structure as well as its functionalities. And so far, most of the work that people are doing, um, except few, they only look at the token properties of the source code, but structure and functions are, I mean, they, I, I am not saying that nobody has looked at it in machine learning uh, way of processing source code, but they, they are far limited. So with this uh, null, I mean, this requirement, now let's see how um, we can detect models for bug detection as well as bug fixes uh, to improve software quality. So for bug detection, I, I, I chose two very different kind of models to show how we can incorporate structure and semantic properties. For a bug detection, this will be a classification model. And for uh, bug fixes, we will talk about a translation and generation model. So I'll go a little bit reverse order. We will talk first about bug uh, fixes. The reason is that this model is much simpler. It's, uh, and it will be easier for us to see what is going on before going to the bug detection model. So we can think of bug fixes as a sequence to sequence model, right? Where I have a think about a typical use of sequence to sequence model in language translation, where say you have a in text of English, like English corpora, and you have a text of French, and your translation model translate from English to French. Now, in context of bug, you can think the same, like you have in one side, you have the code before the edit and you have code after the edit. And the job of your translation model is to learn the change that will translate the code before edit to after edit. So for that, we will, Typically, a typical sequence to sequence model build an encoder that first encodes the code that is your before edit code. And then the decoder takes that representation and generate the after edit code. And you train this whole encoder and decoder together. So earlier research, uh, they use this kind of setting for using like very simple sequence to sequence model, RNN based sequence to sequence model. However, the problem if you just do simple RNN based sequence to sequence model, your decoder generates the code token by token, right? And there is a problem with that because this code that is generating as a sequence to sequence, it has a lot of structure. It is just not the sequence of token like return super dot equals that we are seeing. It also has this hidden tree and which this hidden tree actually guarantees that this code will compile and it is syntactically correct. And not only that, as I kind of, uh, illustrate a little bit earlier, this tree also contains what kind of variables uh, we are looking at. Like say, for example, my super is a reference, dot is a keyword, things like that. And again, this generated code has a lot of dependencies like control, data, long range dependencies, etc. And when we will generate the code using our decoder, we should follow this kind of constraints 
um, to generate much correct code. So with that, we designed a model where first we took the before edit code, we represent the code that before edit code as a tree. We convert that tree, before edit tree to the after edit tree. And then from that tree, we generate the real con I mean, real code uh, with the token name, et cetera, where we will condition our token generation based on the tree structure. So that, that's why here we first introduced a tree translation. And then once I get the tree, I generate the token sequence conditioned on the generated tree. So now how we will do that? If you remember your compiler 101 class, you probably have remem remembered that all the trees, the abstract syntax trees are essentially sequence of context-free grammar rule. So basically we took this tree and represent the tree as a sequence of my context-free grammar rule. So once I represent each tree as a context-free grammar rule, then my tree translation becomes translating sequence of grammar rule, like from the before edit to sequence of grammar rule after edit. And so that's how we incorporate the tree translation. And from that tree translation, uh, we then once the grammar is uh, generated, as a as a as the decoder generates the grammar, then we basically take uh, each grammar, try to expand the leftmost uh, non-terminal, and build the whole abstract syntax tree. So once my abstract syntax tree is built, then basically uh, I take that and then I generate the corresponding token sequence where my tokens will be conditioned on the type that uh, the terminal of the tree provides. So for example, when I will generate the token return object equal to equal to this, here my token equal to equal to I know because of the AST that this we are expecting here a type equal and which will be then much easier and correct to generate uh, be as because this is restricted by the grammar. However, this case is not so simple when we are trying to generate a identifier, right? Because the identifier can be anything in the code. The code has open vocabulary. So to generate more correct identifier, we impose scope analysis. So we will all given an identifier, say for example, here we wanted to generate, we wanted to generate uh, this line, right? Super equals object. Temp2 will never come here, reach it, reached here because temp2 scope is only limited to this if block. So with this kind of scope analysis, we at the location in my edit location, my only reachable identifier is inst object and temp. And that's how I cut down the search space significantly and I can generate more correct code. So with this uh, two uh, like three translation and scope analysis, um, we will see how we performed uh, with rest to generate edits. So for that, we collected from GitHub around 32,000 uh, edit samples. And we also uh, I mean, got our data of pull requests uh, from Tufano et al, which is around 5,000 samples. And as you can see, we are doing much better than the only sequence based baseline uh, for both gen um, identifying generic code edits as well as for generating pull, ed, uh, pull request. So uh, this kind of this, and then we also tried it on a very uh, well used um, Java bug, bug fix data set. 
And we found that CODIT can generate uh, 15, can, um, uh, can completely fix 15 bucks automatically and 10 bucks partially. So which was at that point when we did code it, this was the pretty high number. We were almost beating other uh, traditional uh, bug fix uh, related re literature. And this shows the potential of including tree and scope analysis to in our um, deep, uh, learning model to improve the code quality. So now I will talk a little bit about uh, how to uh, classify bug using this kind of code property. So uh, we all heard about BART. Uh, most likely we all heard about BART, which is a very well, uh, very popular encoder model to encode source code. And then uh, my predecessors, uh, they build on top of part some code relate, I mean, some variation of part that works on code. However, remember, as I said, we have to think about code, uh, not only token, but as well as structure and semantics. So this is the typical part of where you have a language model and you have the original code you use mask language model to mask any token and your BART or transformer's job is to predict that masked token. So here I mask the parenthesis, left parenthesis, and my job will be to predict the left parenthesis properly. So as in my previous work, here we augment each token with its type. Type here is AST type. So all, as you can see here, I have a sequence of token. All the tokens are augmented by its type. And now I added another objective in my training where uh, I will add, I mean, along with predicting the token, which is left parenthesis, I will also predict the type of the token. So here we incorporate structure. However, there is still a code property we i mean that is missing so if um, you guys have heard about contrastive learning so in contrastive learning usually we try to bring the similar objects together in the representation space while the different objects go far apart in the representation space so for example if you see these two cat they are very close to each other I mean, that will be the objective, while the cat and dog, they are not similar, so they will go differ. I mean, they will go far apart. So with the same thought, if I have an original code, I generate some functionally equivalent code by just changing the name of the token or the little bit of changing the declaration of the unrelated tokens so that the look and feel of the code gets changed, but the functionality is still same. And I also, to generate some negative sample, I introduced bug where um, the structure of this original code and the bug injected code will be still very similar, but they, will, they, they, they are functionally not exactly correct, right? And here is for bug injection, we took some uh, very standard security vulnerability kind of patterns. So with that, we uh, introduce a pre-training with, with three objectives, which has mask language model, the language model to predict tree node, as well as contrastive learning. And here is the, we took very standard to vulnerability detection data set. And here is the result. The baseline, which is uh, trained with huge data, like around 20 gig data. When my fine tuning task is vulnerability detection, they performed like around 63% uh, percent accuracy and 45% percent, um, F1 in two data set. Why? In our model, which is boost by training in much smaller data set, which is like 865 MB, we are slightly beating the state of the art. And when we 
increase the data set, but not as big as 20 gig. We are still far below. Uh, we can show that we are uh, beating the, the state-of-the-art vulnerability detection in uh, quite a bit of a margin. So with this, I wanted to emphasize if we introduce uh, domain-specific properties while analyzing code, we can get significant benefit both in terms of accurate, like machine learning accuracy, as well as we can also reduce um, my co uh, training cost. And of course, uh, this is a, this probabilistic way of analyzing program has a lot of potential. This is an active, uh, area, uh, very active area of research. And I think in the long run, if we can incorporate more and more code related properties like API patterns, dynamic traces, previous evolutionary history, et cetera, we can build much more smart software engineering tools. So with that, I would love to uh, thank my collaborators. These two work are uh, developed uh, within collaboration with IBM Research and Microsoft Research. And uh, Shoikat and Robin, they are my uh, student. They are actively involved in these two projects. And with that, I would like to take any question. Thank you so much, Vishaki, uh, for a great talk. And a uh, reminder to everybody in the YouTube audience that you can send in questions. Also a reminder to our students in, uh, in our class uh, to uh, put questions in, in the Q&A uh, on the Zoom webinar. Um, so I guess to uh, kick things off, um, I um, was curious about you know the, the last part of your talk, especially the contrastive learning mm -hmm. uh, approach that you described. And uh, particularly curious if there are some lessons in terms of how to pick the way that you generated those code fragments because uh, you talked about you know code has a lot of different properties and different ways that you could uh, manipulate code in order to change its behavior and you know small changes maybe are uh, cause very large uh, you know shifts in code behavior right. so i'm curious how you how you think about that problem when you're doing contrastive learning because there as you described like when it's a cat and a cat like maybe that's a little bit easier because it's not as discrete sure. but, but code is very discrete and so like defining that kind of similarity seems harder? So that's a very good question. Uh, again, for this one, I mean, for, uh, this is kind of a first project uh, in this line. So we just took some very prevalent uh, security vulnerability pattern. You know, like say, if you see, if you remember the example, two examples I showed, where say less than equal to will not have any buffer overflow, but if I do less than equal to zero, it can introduce buffer overflow. Similarly, like integer overflow, like very, very common vulnerability pattern. We try to inject that kind of code. The, the idea is that this kind of bugs developer very commonly make mistake, even very advanced developer. So let's introduce that. Are there any plans to you know expand how you Absolutely. Yeah. So again, as I, I said, these are very first kind of work uh, in this line. I think how to even inject noise, because what we are showing here, if you targetedly augment data, and here target is stru increased structure property as well as semantic property, you can get very good boost in terms of accuracy as well as resource usage, right? So now I think we should investigate more how you can improve that targeted noise aug augmentation. I actually have a follow up on this. Uh, I think this is like a fascinating. And again, I, I really enjoy this, this line of work on contrastive learning. And I think it's, it's really great. Um, I think that there's, there's a couple of dimensions that I wanted to you know, get your, 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 your thoughts on. One is um, on the negatives, in particular on the generation of negatives. You showed this example where basically the uh, in the end the function is like a bugged function or like a like insecure version of the function. Yes. I think it could be particularly interesting also to see something that looks really similar on a syntactical level, but that then is um, um, you know computing a different function. In right, right. Of, of course. And because, you know, I think it's a matter of how difficult is the negative example. The more absolutely. realistic but wrong it is, right, the, the, probably the better, the, yes. the harder it is for the model to, to distinguish them. And so it gives more pressure to the model to do the right thing. Right. And also another thing, like, 
I think will be very interesting along with that, like there are with certain difference, you know, the performance of a code changes, right? We did not look at those kind of properties. Mm -hmm. uh, and those things also should help model. Um, but like think about the lead code, all those code that you can see given a pro problem, they are functionally should be same. Right. There are different variation of the same function. What can we learn from those stuff? Right, uh, right. So that's for the positives, right? So on the on the positive side, the the, the examples of you want to have. I mean, it depends. I mean, how we will model your positive or negative, right? right. Because say in lit code, if a function is very performance efficient versus performance like not so well performing, that can be example of like where we can introduce another property, which is like performance efficient property. Right, right, right. That sounds great because then you could have translations between- Exactly. Yes. Could do the same thing, but one it's much more efficient. Exactly. Right? So could, yes, no, that's amazing, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Here's another property we might care about um, is readability, right? So exactly. usually we can read code um, and understand what it does. And I'm curious, how readable or interpretable is the code generated with the ML models? Uh, what have you found? So, okay, that is a very good question. So this is a, there is a paper, a little bit older paper. I mean, older means two, three years old paper that shows, you know, if your code has less perplexity, rather, uh, so less perplexity means if the, if your code looks very similar to the training code, trained code, then developers accept this code it is highly likely to be accepted than uh, getting rejected. So basically the point I wanted to make that if your code has high readability with respect to the trained code, probably they are getting accepted. Uh, we did not take that into account yet for code generation, but that is definitely a very good suggestion. I mean, but so I think, but, Incorporating that is, I think, less obvious because the thing is that because you trained the code with already written code and we are assuming they are readable, chances are you are going to generate some sort of readable code. But that is a very good suggestion and we have proof that that, I mean, that helps to write better code. Yeah. I'm kind of curious, what kind of bugs uh, can you kind of detect and fix um, with a kind of code generation um, method, because I noticed some of the I I'm I'm not sure if I was reading some of those numbers correctly. Um, I, I was just curious about some of those numbers. Like, are there certain like common patterns that you were able to detect, and then other patterns that you aren't able to? Because I imagine there's you know all sorts of bugs. Some that would be you know easier to catch, and then others that could be harder. So that's a very good question. For bug detection work, we uh, looked at the like common vulnerabilities. And these two data sets actually curated a lot of um, like open source vulnerabilities that are already there. So instead of taking any assumption, we just learned from them. Uh, so this, this work is mostly on vulnerability detection. And we have another work before where we looked at like this kind of simple vulnerabilities uh, that um, like the CV data sets there, we can do very good with lot, I mean, small variation. But if say there is a zero day vulnerability, right? Where, mm -hmm. you know, the pattern is completely unknown. Mm -hmm. I don't think the supervised model will help there. Right. Because you need more reasoning there. But so from my experience, if you see a pattern, and there are a lot of bugs with slightest variation of that patterns. I think the supervised way of training can help in those cases. Yeah, yeah, that that's really interesting. Um, kind of along those notes, and kind of you know, getting back to some of those contrastive um, questions from earlier. One of the things that so my read of kind of the the way that you encode those positives and negatives is you mm -hmm. you're kind of learning teaching the model to learn the structure. Um, and kind of ignore the like names of variables and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
I wonder, do you, do you think there are any bugs that you would miss from doing that? Like maybe sometimes you have two, two ints that syntactically in the, in the code tree look almost the same, but because they have different names, um, like, uh, I don't know, sometimes I name my variable stupid things like sure, sure. result. So in this version, you know, especially to introduce positive samples, we were very conservative. Mm -hmm. So we first did data flow, data dependency analysis, and we did not change anything which are dependent. Mm -hmm. And then we only change the variable names, like the change the declaration statements, things like that. Mm -hmm. And there, there is a lot of, I mean, lot of scope to even how to inject more intelligent positive samples. Again, sure. this is like this is like very stupid positive samples, I would say. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Like, uh, yeah, like sometimes you can, you know, there's some lines that you can change the order of, and it doesn't matter. And then other lines you change the order, and suddenly you get uh, definitely if there is a say, massive read errors. After right kind of relations, right? That is typical data dependence relationship. Mm -hmm. If you change there, your program semantics will change. Right. Right. Shaki, I have a question. Actually, it's a little bit technical, but you know, uh, I'm I'm really curious about it. With regards to the first part of the talk, when you were talking about the you know injecting the structure, um, and you know, my understanding is that you do it by doing the parse trees of both the inputs and generating the parse tree as the output, and then deriving the correction mm -hmm. from the parse tree. Um, I think I'm curious about a couple of things. One is um, this assumes, at least at the input level, that you have access to the full function where the um, um, bug uh, or like thing that you wanted to change is coming from, right? And and so that you know gives it's more context that you may have. So I just wanted to understand how does it work? Like, do you always have that context or not? And actually, the second question is related to the you know generation part, which is you have all the uh, you're generating all these rules. Um, that then create like a grammar for generating the code, mm -hmm. but you don't have like a strong guarantee that these rules will be in themselves grammatical. Like there could be like an arrow that is missing or like a separation that is missing, or maybe the um, token name can be wrong at some, in some places mm -hmm. in the generation. So I'm curious, what's your experience there? How many times you see that happen? And if there's any solution for this problem? So, okay, to answer the first question, uh, we did not require the full function. Mm -hmm. However, we have the granularity. I think we took the AST length of 12, like three depth of 12, Got something it. like that. So it's like, a. but in general, if your function is small, then within that range, it can most of, I mean, a lot of small functions can be incorporated. But if the function is really big, this tool cannot scale. Mm -hmm. So basically, we assume a small uh, tree, I mean, a code elements of small tree there. Makes sense, makes sense. Uh, so with, which has a problem, actually, I mean, I wanted to mention, the fixes that we can generate are very small fixes, because we were limited with that tree depth window. Mm -hmm. And then as you generate more, I mean, longer fixes, you tend to introduce more bugs. Makes sense. Makes right. Sense. So that relates to your second question. And I, I think, I mean, here in, in our tree translation model, first we present a tree as a sequence of grammar. And each grammar rule is our token there. So basically, if my grammar, think about a context free grammar, say if my context free grammar is, say, E is generating. In the AB or alpha beta, this is a token in my con in my um, grammar rule transformation. So it is highly unlikely that we will misplace an arrow because we are taking the whole grammar as a token. Got it, got it, got it. However, where we will make a mistake, the sequence of two grammar rules, right? And for that, what we did when we are, I mean, um, I kind of quickly passed that uh, thing over. When from decoder gives me a sequence of grammar rules. And from there, we are again generating the abstract syntax tree of, like the, of the patch, right? So when we are generating the patch, we are expanding the tree. And if some grammar rule are not uh, matching, 
the my leftmost terminal, we are discarding the full suggestion and taking got the it. second one. Got it, got it, got it. Oh, this is perfect. Thank you very much for the explanation. Yeah. Sure, but these are like very insightful questions. I, I kind of skipped because I thought that. Yeah, yeah, no, we're just, you know, curious about that. But that that's great. <laughs> that's really great. Hey, Vaisharki, I had a question. Um, so recently, uh, GitHub made a lot of noise with the Copilot model that basically mm -hmm. would fill in code snippets for you. And one of the problems with that that people found is it learned from lots of open source code, but it often learned and put in um, suggestions that are actually incorrect. For example, suggestions that have security holes. And you know, so, so basically right. it looks like learning from uh, lots of code out there doesn't necessarily mean you learn something good. So I know it's different from what you're doing, but I'm curious if you want you know, to succeed with machine learning in this space, how do you avoid that kind of problem and, and still use the ability of machine learning to, you know, to scale to large data and all that? So this is actually, I mean, we are currently actively thinking on that and this uh, contrastive learning where we, we uh, showed the model, exposed the model, you know, these are my the vulnerable code. So leave them like far apart in the representation space uh, that can be, I mean, we did not try it for code generation yet because we just did it for encoder, but the next uh, kind of uh, what we are thinking, how we can like take this constraint in my decoder so that to generate a little bit less secure vulnerable code. Uh, so I- Okay, I, yeah. I don't have, but this is like, this is a very important, I think would be a very important area of research as well. Like how, because one thing you can do, right? You can do always a post-processing and then check with static analysis, et cetera. But I wanted to incorporate that constraints in my model. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, definitely the, the techniques you described are nice because you're generating the bad code or the equivalent code. You're not just picking it up from like random people, but you know, I think the, the allure of machine learning is that you can scale, you can just learn from lots of stuff, which requires less human input. But yeah, it's a, I, yeah. And here I also want to mention in this context, because we showed that if you incorporate domain knowledge, right, you actually need much less resource. So maybe you see. Mm -hmm. So if you remember the, the slide, we take around 900 MB where CodeBart took 20 GB data. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that, so, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. So the, I mean, the, the, the message I wanted to give that if you do augmentation in a more targeted manner, you get better benefit. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Bashaki, as we kind of uh, get to the end of the hour, um, I'm wondering, you know, all these tools seem like really, really cool. Part of me is wondering, like, when when I'll be able to use it to, you know, fix bugs in my own code. Um, when do you think we'll be at a place where I can, you know, download the the latest version of, you know, VS Code, and then it will start suggesting bug fixes um, and things like that? Was it like, a, you know, one year, five years, uh, 10 years down the line? What's your, what do you think? So I would, my, I mean, again, you know, these things will take time to be very accurate, but I think the bare minimal version, I, I know a lot of companies, including GitHub, we already see or they are working on it. Um, mm -hmm. I think people will soon start using them. Sounds exciting. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of smart ideas actually suggest some bare minimal, very easy fixes, right? So it is not completely out of the line. Right. Maybe I'll have to stop using Vim someday. <laughs> <laughs> I use Vim, so. <laughs> I, I've been using uh, GitHub Copilot and uh, uh, I, I realized I started relying on it more and uh, it, it, there can be very, you know, silent bugs that it introduces sometimes. I think there, I was reading a, a write-up that 40% of these, pro, I mean, of the generated code has some issues. I mean, the vulnerability issues and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully when you're writing research code, it doesn't matter as much, but uh, yeah, but hopefully for production systems, uh, you know, people aren't, aren't doing that. Um, thanks so much, Vishaki, for, for joining us for this, uh, the YouTube seminar. 
Um, I want to thank everybody in the audience for tuning in. Uh, go to our website, mlsys.stanford.edu, um, and subscribe to the YouTube channel and mailing list. Uh, we send out uh, emails every week about talks that are happening. Um, next week, we're going to have uh, Ji Hao Jia from CMU uh, talking about, I think. What he is, didn't. What? He didn't tell us yet, but I assume it's okay. going to be uh, something to do with his uh, his PhD research, which I think okay. Matei co advised. Okay, well, uh, uh, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, see you everyone on YouTube.